Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back after our off-season hiatus for another episode of Fireside Chat. And as always, it's Dan here alongside Matt. How you doing, Matt? Good. How are you enjoying the Stanley Cup playoffs? Good. It's been a interesting couple games to the Stanley Cup finals. We're tied at one between Tampa and Chicago as of the recording. And it's been enjoyable. Do you want to make any predictions as to who you think is going to walk away with Lord Stanley's mug? I think it'll be Chicago, but I'm hoping that Tampa Bay can uh, get the cup so Jay Feaster can get rewarded for being with Tampa, I guess. He did such a good job uh, with the Flames beginning their rebuild. So, you know, I'd like to see anybody that was involved with that get some success elsewhere. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about both of these teams. I mean, you know, really I don't care that much about the Lightning being that they're Eastern Conference and all that. But, you know, they are the team that stood between us and the Cup last time we went all the way. And uh, Chicago, I just, I don't know, I'm not a big Blackhawks fan. No, like they've won enough lately. Like it kind of gets old seeing the same team again and again and again. They're the closest thing we have to a dynasty. Yeah. Well, if it, they had better cap management over the years, they would probably have a couple more cups in the last few years as well. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's I think another debate for another time. But I don't know that you could do a lot better cap management and still be able to put out a competitive team. True. Well, Matt, we're back today to talk um, about the draft. We're going to do this over two shows. This show, we're going to profile all the players that the Flames might take in the first round with the 15th overall pick. And then next show, we're going to talk about the second through seventh round. But before we get to the draft, there's some uh, Flames news that we should cover. First, let's look at the comings and goings. Um, the Flames signed this week a right winger, Loic Marcotte, from... Uh, Gatineau of the QMJHL. And uh, what's your take on Marcotte? Uh, He's a solid right winger. Uh, He put up a lot of points in junior, 180 or so in the last two years. Not a bad player. He will engage physically. He's not short. He's 6'1". It's only an AHL contract, so it's sort of like Garnett Hathaway last year. He's a right shooting right winger, which is the biggest hole in the Flames organizationally, so I don't see any problem with it. He's 21. Is he undrafted, or was he drafted yes. and unsigned? He was just completely undrafted. Okay. So, yeah, he had 100 points last year in the QMJHL, 42 goals, 58 assists. This year he's sitting at 76 with 36 goals and 40 assists. So a guy who can put up numbers at that level, we'll see how he does um, – next year in the AHL. Yeah, and we'll be able to see him during the development camp as well, so we'll get a bit of a better read in July. Yeah, and that'll that'll be nice to see him, but, you know, we've seen the Flames do very well with some of these free agent signings they brought in over the last few years, especially from, you know, the, the three Canadian Junior Leagues, so I'm hoping this one will turn out very well. Yeah, like if he turns out anywhere near as good as both Garnett Hathaway and Josh Juris have been, it, you know, it's a win. So if he develops, it's great. If not, well, at least you filled an organizational depth role for a while. And to go along with the signing of a player, the Flames also opted not to sign a, one of our prospects, Eric Roy, who we drafted in 2013 in the fifth round, uh, which was pick 135 that year. Uh, he's played with Br- the Brandon Weed Kings for pretty much his whole WHL career. The Flames opted not to sign him. And if you've listened to Trill Living talk about it, it sounds like they just feel like they need that roster spot for somebody else and... Um, they haven't said no to Roy ever coming back, but for right now, they don't feel like they want to uh, keep him around. What are your thoughts on this one? It's one of those things that offensively, he's a very good player, and he it, he might even find more success at the next level if he transitioned to a forward, but there was no progression since he was drafted in his defensive game. 
and if you're looking for a defenseman, you would hope that he would be at least passable defensively as, as an offensive defenseman, but he was pretty much terrible the entire time. It's one of those things he could figure it out, but he hasn't in the last three years, so there's it's understandable why they didn't. As a six foot three defenseman, I have no doubt that he'll find work in the ECHL or some lower level league and maybe straighten himself out there. Maybe that's all he's going to need. But yeah, I'm not surprised. And I believe he's eligible to go back in the draft as well. So if he does, I could see somebody maybe taking a run at him in the sixth or seventh round. Yeah. Uh, especially if they, uh, whichever team doesn't have any offensive defensemen in their system like he would be a good fit in the AHL but you know I I can see why the Flames didn't especially if you look at the AHL roster they already have eight or nine prospects that are going to be in the A next year and uh, probably a couple that will be sliding to the ECHL just for playing time purposes so it does make some sense. Yeah, and I think, too, if you look at the defensive prospects the Flames have and some of the guys they're bringing in, they probably knew that the Eric Roy of that group is not going to really make it probably at the NHL level, and they could use that ECHL contract for something better. Like I think that if you look at the depth chart, there's no way Roy would be in the top seven defensemen. No, he would be in the ECHL if the Flames did sign him. I think his spot was more or less taken by the signing of Kenny Morrison. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely going to be some players that the Flames are going to let go that you could argue might have uh, might be Morrison's spot, but yeah, I see what you're saying. And if you look at that, that was overall a pretty good draft year for the Flames. That's the year they got Monaghan, Poirier, Klimchuk, Kanzig, Roy, Harrison, Rafikoff, and Gilmore. So, you know, very strong first round, especially that year. Yep, and Kanzig should be graduating, although he may go for an overage, like an over-overage year, but that's yet to be seen. Yeah, and I and yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the Flames do there, but I, I have no, no qualms about not signing Eric Roy. I think it's fine if the Flames decide not to, and maybe if he strains himself up, he'll come back here. Yeah, uh, like I could see the Flames bringing him into the development camp again just to give him one more kick at the can if he doesn't get drafted by somebody else, but it's not a big deal either way. Speaking of prospects, uh, we have another prospect in the news from 2014. We had our second-round pick, Hunter Smith, who played with the Oshawa Generals winning the Memorial Cup. Did you watch any of those games? I watched the last one. And I liked his goal that was waved off where he batted it out of the air about a foot over the crossbar. <laughs> yeah, he, he seems like he's a pretty good player. He seems like he's really got, getting his all-around game in, in place. Yeah, and he was basically tasked with shutting down the other team's top lines. And like in the OHL finals, that included Connor McDavid and Dylan Strom. And uh, in the Memorial Cup, the final game, it was Leon Dreisaitl. So anytime you can have a Flames prospect shutting down a pair of Oilers, that's always good. That could be a sign of things to come. And for those that don't know, Hunter Smith is a right shooting right winger. He's six foot six and 210. He's a big boy. And I think even with those kind of stats and the fact that now he is a Memorial Cup winner, I think he might perhaps get more of a look than he would have otherwise with the Flames this coming off season. Yeah, and he could very well. I wouldn't be shocked entirely if he did end up making the opening day roster, but he does have a lot of skill. I know a lot of people thought when the Flames drafted him that they were basically getting a fighter and that was it, but there is more skill there than one would think i'd be pretty shocked if they ended up um, having him on the opening day roster i think there's a lot of guys especially in the forward ranks who are going to be above him on the depth chart and we haven't even seen what happens july 1st yet true well there's just so many good players in the flame system that 
who knows who's going to surprise. Like, nobody thought Juris would come out of nowhere last year, so. That's true. Juris also had some AHL experience. Yeah. One season. Yeah, but still knowing what it takes at that level. We'll see. I mean, you know, it's not it's not impossible, but I think that those forward spots especially are going to be heavily contested this offseason. Well, that's really all the Flames news that's happened since uh, we broadcast last. It's the off season, so there's not a whole lot going on for the Flames. Um, we have still some outstanding UFAs and RFAs who the Flames have to sign, and we'll see over the next couple weeks what happens with those contracts, and we'll report on that again probably just after the entry draft. But, Matt, I think it's time we jump into looking at the draft picks. What do you think? Sounds like a plan. So the There's way, a lot of different players to get through. There is. So the way we'll do this is similar to how we've done it in the past. Um, we'll talk about each one of the picks that the Flames have in this year's injury draft, and then we'll talk about players who we think the Flames might take in that with that pick and give you a little bit of a kind of background on those players so you know who, the, who they are, what you need to know about them, that sort of thing. So... Let's jump right into the first round. Uh, the, we only have one first round pick this year, and it is our pick. It's the Calgary Flames pick, and it'll be the fifteenth overall pick. Before we, actually, yeah, before we talk about players here, Matt, um, we know this is a deep draft. We know that even at fifteen, we're probably going to get a really good player. Do you think that there's much point in the Flames trying to trade up in this one? It depends. If a guy like Provorov falls to like say 10 or 11 or so then it might be an interesting proposition to trade up but realistically the difference between say a guy at 10 versus a guy at 15 there's not a a huge amount of difference there's so much quality in this draft that it's quite ridiculous And that's really nice to see, too, that, you know, for a team like the Flames, who are supposed to be rebuilding, are expected to get low round, low draft picks, or sorry, high draft picks, I guess, like one, two, three, and finish low in the league, even at 15, we're not really being punished, if you will, for having a good season. No, like some of the players that should be on the board at 15 last year would have been in the top 10. So it's just one of those weird things with this particular draft that there's just so much talent and like there isn't really a severe drop off like from after one two there's a drop off but like from three right through to the end of the first round there isn't that same level of drop off that you would normally see. The fir- the first guy that we're going to talk about is Kyle Connor. He's a six foot one, one hundred and sixty three pound forward. Uh, you've listed him as a left wing on our site, and Elite Prospects has him as a centerman. But he shoots left, and he's a U.S. born player. What are your thoughts? What do we need to know about Kyle Connor? He is one of the very fastest players in this draft, and that is a good thing. It because it fits with the Flame system. But in addition to being very fast, he is has very good hands, very good shot, basically everything that you would want in a player. He's basically Andrew Cogliano with top line skill. And he could very well become a first line forward. He is going to the NCAA, so he'll probably be two or three years in college. So does that at mean least. we would have four years uh, before we'd have to sign him? Does he apply? Yes. For, yeah, he applies for that NCAA rule. Yes. So it would be a good thing. He's more of a project in terms of like t- developmental time, but he checks all the boxes for anything that you'd be looking for in a forward. Unfortunately, I do believe he's rated 13th, so he probably won't be there at 15. Yeah, it depends whose rankings you're looking at. Um, ISS is rated him 13. Um, and NHL Central Scouting's rated him 13. Some people rate him as high as 11. So, yeah, he's expected to go between 11 and 13, so probably won't be a guy who will be available. But, but in, you if never we can know. get him, yeah, he might he might fall. Often by the time you get to those middle teens, you're seeing teams starting to draft a little bit out of order too. Yeah, exactly. So you never know 
who's on board. Like, you could see a guy that's rated 7th or 8th fall to 15. Because, like, we've seen that in the past with a guy like Cam Fowler, who fell from, I think he was rated 3rd and ended up going 13th. Mm -hmm. So, who knows? And I think this is a guy who a lot of teams are going to have their eye on, too. So, if he is available... Even if it's past 11th, I could see the teams at 13 and 14 taking them first. True. And you got to figure that L.A. having the 13th overall selection, I would be shocked if he got past them. That still sounds weird to me that last year Stanley Cup champions pick lower than us. Well, it's because we're better. It's <laughs> true. Would you, would you Let's say that L.A. is on the board and they think that uh, – and the Flames think they're going to take Connor. Would you trade up to get him? Is he that much better than the other prospects? If it was something small, maybe, but not really. Like it, if it was something like, say, here, take Max Reinhardt. Okay, sure, why not? But beyond that, nah. I haven't seen a lot of footage of Connor. Um, being in the USHL, we don't get a lot of the games here, and I'm finding limited stuff online. But from what I have seen, he seems like he's the guy who has the ability to both be a playmaker or kind of a sniper. He He's always looking and deciding if he should make the play or shoot the puck, which I think is really important, especially in a centerman. And from what I have seen, he looks like he's got a really nice two-way game. Yeah, that's basically why I made the comparison with Andrew Cogliano, because he does have a pretty good two-way game. Uh, it's one of those things, like if this was, say, last year's draft, he probably would have been taken fifth. Wow. So it's this draft's just that crazy. So Kyle Connor is sort of our, our um, I guess, our dark horse. He's the guy to take if he's available. Well, we don't think that he'll be there. Exactly. All right, well, moving down the list then, we have another winger. This is uh, Travis Konechny. Took us a little while to figure out how to say his name. He played in uh, Ottawa of the OHL this year. 60 games played. He had 29 goals, 39 assists for 68 total points. And he's a center and right wing is how he's listed, who shoots right. He's a smaller guy, 5'10 and 176 pounds. What do you think of Konechny? I like him as a player. He's a very dynamic player, very shifty. He is Bo, Bo Horvat's cousin from the Vancouver Canucks. It, there's a lot of skill with Konechny. It's just that do the Flames really want to get another player that's under six feet tall? That's the only drawback with both him and Nick Merkley, is that they're both a little on the short side, and... You, they play a more physical game, the pair of them, so it's one of those things injuries may become a problem. Yeah, though I think if any team is going to say that, hey, we know how to manage the small players, it would probably be the Flames coming into this draft. Konechny is also a guy who, um, depending on where you're looking, he's quite varied in where people think he's going to go some uh hockey prospect.com thinks he'll go 20th and the nhl central scouting thinks 14th iss thinks 12th so there's quite a bit of a difference there in where people think he's going to go why do you think we have such difference on this player i think it mostly has to do with height like if you're talking just raw skill 12 to 14 is about right it's just with the height that's a drawback because like if you look at uh, the other guys that are rated in the teens uh they're all about six feet tall other than merkley or six two like in that range both merkley and konechny are both on the short side so that might drop them on some rankings I've been watching a lot of Ottawa 67's games uh over the last little bit trying to get a little more on konechny um I think one of the things he has going for him is that he has served as captain of the 67, so he's definitely got that leadership there. And I was also noticing as I watched him, and curious to see if you noticed this too, but even for a guy of his size, he seems like he's not afraid to play with grit. And he looks a lot bigger than he actually is when he's on the ice because of that. True. I just, the only thing I'm concerned about is that he may get into injury troubles because of that 
Like, if you look at a guy in a past draft, Gilbert Boule, he played a very similar game to both Konechny and Merkley, and he ended up getting derailed because of injuries. So that's the only concern I have with either Konechny or Merkley is getting hit by the injury bug. And on his profile that you wrote on firesidechat.ca, you said that out of 10, um, your interest in the Flames selecting Konechny was zero. So you're really not all that high on this player. It's because of the size. Like uh, The Flames already have Gaudreau. The, the, you can't have too many short players. Uh, and the talent level between a guy like Konechny and Svechnikov or Sprong or Besser or any of the defensemen, they're, it's virtually indistinguishable from one another. So I'd rather go with a, a bigger player where that isn't an issue. That's that's the only reason. Like, if the Flames took Konechny, I wouldn't be going, oh, that was a waste of a pick. What are you doing? It, you know, sort of like the Greg Nemus pick. But, you know, it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be annoyed or anything. It's just, there are so many good options that why go with somebody with a question mark? Good point, especially with your first round pick. Question marks generally come later in the draft. All right, well, the next guy that we're going to look at then is a winger. He can play both left and right wing. Um, a player who isn't as isn't as uh, well-known, perhaps, as the other two, but this is uh, Evgeny Svechnikov. He's played in the QMJHL this past year for the, for the Cape Britain Screaming Eagles, and he had 32 goals, 46 assists for 78 points. And depending on where you look on this guy, he's ranked to go anywhere between about 16th and 23rd in this draft. And Matt, you're thinking the Flames might take him in the uh, 15th pick, but you're all, you only have an interest of 5 out of 10 in them selecting Svechnikov. What's the downside of this player first off? Uh, mainly his, he's Russian. That's... Uh... And you'll be hearing that refrain like uh, whenever a Russian player like Samsonov or Garanov gets mentioned. It, it's just the fact that the Russians, they have that whole KHL thing. So that puts some question marks. I've also heard, though, that the KHL's um, kind of going bankrupt over there, so I don't know if they're still as, as much of an option as they were a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's just one of those things that I'm still a little hesitant, uh, but uh, apparently the NHL and KHL are also close to an actual uh, transfer agreement, so that would allay a lot of fears that teams have, especially when you're talking about a guy like Garanoff who should be a top, 15 pick himself but because he stayed in the KHL he's rated to go in the middle of the second round so it's 6-2 201 uh Svechnikov is NHL sized what's what are the upsides of this player dynamite's shot he's a good all-around offensive player he's already NHL sized so he could even step in next year although you wouldn't do that but uh there's no real downside to him. He's a dynamic, shifty player. It, the only reason why I only rated him a 5 was because he's Russian. Like, if he was a Canadian, it would probably be an 8 or a 9. So, it's just I'm still a little leery about that whole thing. Uh, especially after Bear Chi, you know, flaking on us a bit. So. Yeah, I th that's kind of a different scenario, but yeah. True. I think just it's, a little eerie. That's all. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could even say before Berchi, oh, what about Tim Erickson flaking on us? I mean, you know, we made the best of that one, and maybe not the best of the Berchi one, but it happens from time to time. True. So Svechnikov, great player. You're thinking if he's not, uh, if it wasn't for the Russian factor, or you know, the Flames had some assurance that he's not going back to Russia, um, he would probably be number two on your list behind Kyle Connor. In that two to five range, because there's a bunch of guys that are like all neck and neck. So, but we'll be talking about the other guys. So, well, let's uh, let's move on then from Svechnikov. Um, 
Not a lot to say about him. You know, he's been playing over here. I think that, as you said, he's a great player. But, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the Russian factor myself. Yeah, and the Oilers apparently are very heavily interested in him. So, and they pick at 16. So, we'll, you know, it, it could very well be that he'll be drafted right after the Flames if they go in a different direction. Yeah, you never know. Depending on how, uh, how anxious they are to get him, they might even trade up to make sure they get him. Yeah, and you got to figure that they have Yakupov, so it kind of makes some sense to get another Russian player. Yeah, if I was uh, if I was Trilliving, I might almost screw with Torelli a bit and go, oh, yeah, we're going to take this player and make them try to move up. The next guy is a guy that I've seen. Um, I saw him play here in Calgary against the Hitmen a few times, and I've watched some of his games online. This is Nick Merkley, who plays with the Kelowna Rockets of the WHL. Uh, he's a Calgary boy. He's five foot ten, one nine, 192 pounds, and he's listed as both a right winger and a centerman. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts? Let's start with the pros on Merkley. It's very much the same as Konechny. They're, he's a very good offensive threat he's very good at passing very good shot great playmaking abilities no problem and the only thing i'm concerned about with merkley is he does have injury concerns already and he does play physically and being 510 that can be a bit of an issue and that's probably why we have such a range again on where he's expected to go. Uh, NHL Central Scouting thinks he'll probably go 23rd among North American skaters. ISS thinks 19th. I've seen him list as high as 15th. So that probably has a lot to do with that as well. Yeah. It, I would If I had to pick between the two, I'd go with Konechny just because he isn't dealing with any injury troubles where Merkley is. From what I saw of Merkley when I saw him play against the Hitmen this year is he really seems like he is maybe what the Flames need in a centerman, and that's much more of a playmaker than a, a sniper. He always seemed like he had that eye for making the play, um, and he had a great, I guess, hockey sense would be the best way to say it, is he always seemed to know what was going on the on the ice around him much more than you would usually see from a guy of his age. Um, but yeah, he's, he doesn't have the dynamic skating that I think you need at the NHL. I think there'd be a lot of work that has to be done in his skating, which I don't know if you want to bring in a project like that in the first round. And yeah, that's why I could see a team that's around where Vancouver's picking around 22nd or something going with them because the upside is there. It's just, you know, like if you, he does develop, you're getting a really dynamite player, but it, there's not as much of a need for risk at 15. No, there's not. And I and I don't think that we I don't think that he's necessarily the best option and I think he'll definitely be on the board, but it'll depend who else is on the board as well. Yeah, there's just too many good players this year. So you don't need to go with somebody that has issues, especially when there are so many others that don't. Yeah, I I can see Merkley falling even into the 20 range in the first round um because I think that there's a he's he's got a lot of his game but a lot of the kind of personal stats and individual stats he's just especially his decision making needs some some work so we'll see where he goes but I don't think that there's any reason to move up to get Merkley I think there's enough options there without moving up all right, well, next guy on the list is yet another winger. There's a lot of wingers this year in the top bit, and this guy is from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, he's 18-year-old, six foot, 183 pounds. This is Daniel Sprong. And uh, interesting to note, he has dual citizenship, so he has both um, citizenship in the Netherlands and Canada. What do you think about Sprong? If we're talking just on ice play, he would be a top five pick this year he is that good he is a very dynamite shifty all-around offensive threat he has a bullet shot pinpoint accurate very good playmaker there's no problems with him on the ice he is a dynamic shifty right shooting right winger exactly what the flames need 
The problem is, is that his father and he, there's attitude issues and, you know, he's a bit of a question mark in the attitude department. Anytime somebody mentions the father, this is where I get the bear cheek comparison. Because that was his big thing was his dad doing a lot of talking back home about the Calgary Flames. Yeah. And the one good thing is, is that the owner of the team that he plays for, the Charlottetown Islanders, is one of the Flames scouts. So he, the Flames probably more than anybody would know Daniel Sprong inside and out. And Mason McDonald, the Flames' second-round pick last year, is the goaltender for that team. So if they think that his attitude issues are just overblown a bit and that like they can work with him, I would actually be somewhat shocked if the Flames didn't pick him. But if they think that his attitude issues are enough to be worried about, then they'll go in a different direction. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned kind of the attitude and the mental side of things because if you've listened to Treliving talk lately, he's actually been mentioning how they've been spending a lot of uh, more time than usual doing psychological assessments of these players, and that's probably a lot of the reason why is they want to avoid, you know, these kind of head cases where the guys are too high on themselves. Yeah, and, you know, you need to have some players that, like, you can't just have everybody being a nice guy. But you need there's a line there, and you we need don't to, to be, be nice, able to teach. But you you have to yeah you have to be open to you know learning your craft and bettering yourself. Yeah, like you look at Patrick Kane. He's not you know by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know a lot of people don't like him, but he is receptive to learning, and he is a good two way player now, and. He is an one of the overall best players in the NHL. Now, if Sprong is willing to learn and work on his defense and all that, then you could have a superstar here with Sprong. But that's a if and a maybe. For people that aren't familiar with uh, Sprong and his game, what NHL player could you compare him to? Sort of like Ilya Kolchuk. He's that kind of a caliber, a sniper. He's a very good overall offensive player. The thing that I like um, about Sprung when I've been watching some footage of him is he's a he's very offensively dominant, but even at his age, he's also defensively responsible, which you don't see a lot from those kind of snipers. And I think that's one thing that might help him go a bit earlier in the draft is teams think he's a much more well-rounded player. Yeah, and the fact that he's plays the position that the Flames need the most in the prospect pool and that he is a dynamic offensive talent if they believe his attitude because they would know the best of anybody I would be surprised if they didn't take him if they think it's all right I think Sprung is going to be a question mark for a lot of teams not just the Flames like, I could even see him falling into the middle of the second round if everybody thinks that he's too much of a head case to deal with. And, you know, with a couple second-round picks, I would be very interested in the Flames taking him if he was still available when we when we make our pick in that round. Because even if he's a head case, you, you can still cut your losses on one pick and, you know, rely on the others. Uh, the next guy on the list that you'd highlighted is yet another winger. Uh, this is Brock Besser. Brock Besser, for those that don't know about him, he is another U.S.-born player, uh, right winger, shoots right. He's six foot and uh, 192 pounds. I was kind of interested that you. I was kind of interested in why you included him on this list for the 15th pick because everywhere I've ever seen him ranked, he's expected to go in the late 20s. So why do you think he's much better than everyone else? Uh, it's not so much that uh, I think he's better than everybody else, but if the Flames decide to trade down, he might be a good selection. He's more or less Morgan Klimchuk with a little bit more dynamism to his game. He's a little bit better, a little flashier. Overall, he's a little better, but it would I wouldn't take him at 15, but if the Flames did opt to move down to, say, 21 or something like that, he might be a decent option. 
So he's kind of your backup guy. Your hey, we moved down. We didn't get the guy we wanted. He's not a bad number two choice. Exactly. Like if the, say the Flames are really wanting Kyle Connor and he's not available at fifteen, and like the number two guy on their list is Besser, then trading down if you can get an extra second round pick or something, why not? He, he's not a bad player. It, so, I've I've heard Besser compared almost as a poor man's Patrick Sharp. Uh, what do you think of that comparison? Yeah, I could see that. He's he's a good player. Like that's the thing about this draft. Like he's rated around thirtieth, and yet he has first line upside. So you know this draft is a little nuts. Yeah, and and because he does have that kind of upside, I definitely think he'll go in the top thirty. It's just a matter of where. Um, I can't see him falling too far into the second round. What about you? No, like it, I would be shocked if he made it to 35 if he didn't get picked in the first round. Well, Matt, we're finally moving past the forwards in this round. Lots and lots of forwards in this round, which I think is good, but also at the same time, the Flames need a defenseman. So I think that, you know, I, I kind of wish that there were more high ranking defensemen in and around our area. But the next guy that you've mentioned is Jakob Zaborl. And for those that don't know about him, he's a Czech born player. He's a defenseman, six foot one, 185 pounds. And he played for the St. John sea dogs this past season. Um, again, another guy who is by most accounts looked to go at in kind of the, the f- opening part of the 20 to 25 picks. Um, but you're quite high on this guy. You're interested in the Flames selecting him's 9 out of 10. Why do you think that he's so highly ranked? Uh, he's a very physical two-way defenseman. Like, if you're coming down his side of the ice, he will hit you. And he's fairly strong as well. Plus, he plays a good offensive game. He's very responsible defensively, but he can also make a good outlet pass, good shot. There's not really any weaknesses in his game. It it would be great if he was six foot three, but he's only six one. That's the only downside with him. I wonder if there's NHL rules against putting these guys in one of those medieval stretching boards. Should I use that on Gaudreau? <laughs> Draft these guys and just stretch them until rookie camp. Um. So I mean, you obviously see. This player is a player that you think the Flames should draft at 15th, or is he a guy that you draft if we move yeah, down? Yeah, at 15th. Okay. Uh, it, he is a very composed player. Like You don't need to add a whole bunch of teaching to get him NHL ready. He's very composed as it is. So like if he does improve, that'll just make him more of a star caliber player than just an NHL defenseman. So um TSN and Craig Button or yeah, Craig Button have this guy rated about 14th. So that's about where you're thinking. And I think it would make sense considering the Flames are short on defensive depth to bring him in. Um mm-hmm. what are the downsides of picking this player? What what do we have to worry about with Zaboral? Uh he's not as good offensively as I would like. Like, he is good, but he's not great. That's all. So you're getting more of a... Well, I wouldn't even say Ladislav Smead. I would say, like... Gee, what's a good comparison? I've heard him compared to Keith Yandel. Yeah. Without the slap shot. If that makes sense. But, yeah, I mean, I've always looked at Yandel as a good, hard-working defenseman who... Unless he was shooting with that shot, he was not all that noticeable most shifts, but you knew he was there because he was doing the right things. Yeah, exactly. And just a solid all-around guy. Like a good number three, number four defenseman. Like if he does improve, then like he might end up developing into a top pairing guy. And I've also heard some people say that this could be one of the home run picks in this draft. Outside the first two or three guys who we all know, I've heard some people say that Zaboral could be the guy to watch going forward from this first round. The question is, what do you think the likelihood is that he's still on the board at 15th? Fairly decent. Uh, it, it really depends on what the other teams need. 
that are picking ahead of us. Like, the top 12, I expect to all be gone by 15. So, that only leaves two picks. So, you know, if Zaboral's gone, then, you know, you have a decent chance that Connor's going to be there. So, it really just depends on what the other teams are looking at. Well, let's talk about another defenseman then, the next guy on your list for uh, the Flames to take at 15th. There's a Quebec uh, native, Canadian-born, uh, Thomas Chabot. He's 18, plays defense, and shoots left. He's 6'2 and 181 pounds. And Actually, he's Zaboral's uh, defense partner. Oh, is he? Okay, yeah, excellent. Coincidentally. So, so, so the Flames, if they're viewing one, are going to be viewing the other, which is always yeah. good. And this is a player you're very high on. On our website, you rank your interest in the Flames taking him at 10 out of 10. What makes you so excited about uh, Chabot? He is a little raw. He's not going to be stepping in for probably two years, three years. More like a Watherspoon developmental path. But he has all the tools that you need. It's just he needs to just put them... Like he's a lot less polished than Zaboral. That's all. Uh, he's six foot two, so hopefully he can get another inch and be a you know six foot three, solid. He's just a good player. That, that's all. There's not really any deficiencies in his game. He plays more in a same similar style as the Flames' defense, like a Chris Russell and all that. And you've said so, that he reminds you a lot of Duncan Keith. In what way? Uh, he knows where to be on the ice to prevent the other team's players from getting good opportunities. Like, Keith is always very cerebral in knowing where the people are and knowing where he needs to be to cut them off. And Chabot, he does have that kind of positioning. Whether it, the rest of his game develops or not, who knows. So if, if you were the Flames, you're going up to pick at 15th, and both of them are on the board, and you've decided you want to take a defenseman, would you take Zaboral or Chabot? Oh, uh, that is one heck of a tough one. I would probably go with Chabot, but talk to me in a week, and I'd probably flip it and yeah. then go back. They're that and then close? Go back. Yeah, it would be a coin toss for me. And from what I've seen of both of those defensemen, I think that one of them is not going to be around a 15th. Like, I think it's very unlikely that they'll have both of them there that late in the draft. Um, I think they're both really highly thought of defensemen, and I think someone's going to want one of them. Yeah. And honestly, if one's gone and say like Connor and one of the two defensemen is gone at – uh, 15 then you don't really have that much of a problem picking the other one if that's where you're gonna go true yeah and if they're both gone for some reason we also have another option there if the flames wanted to draft a defenseman yeah this one's a bit of a project but it's a very interesting one well you said that you were you gave him 10 out of 10 for your interest in uh becoming a calgary flame of this draft Another 18-year-old, this time from Sweden. He's another left-shooting defenseman, six foot, 181. This is Oliver Kylington. And what makes you so excited about Kylington? You cannot teach offensive skill like Kylington has, period. He is dynamite. He is, put it this way, he outscored uh, Eric Carlson in the same leagues at the same age and actually played at higher levels than... Carlson at the same age so he knows how to get points and if he can transition to the NHL he could easily be a 60 70 point offensive defenseman the problem is is that he's a bit of a question mark on the defensive side and he had a back injury in the early part of the year that kind of screwed with him a bit now if the back injury is not a big deal sort of like Bennett's shoulder last year, then you're getting basically a top five pick at 15. If the injury is a big deal, then you just don't go there. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those things. It would, 
you would need inside information and knowing the player himself. Are the teams allowed to have uh, their own doctors look at these guys prior to the draft? I think uh, you're allowed to survey them, like and like bring them in for to talk to them. But I don't think you can do additional testing other than the combine. But I do believe they go through full medicals and they would be interviewing the player himself, so they would be able to get a better idea from the player to see, because a, a lot of. Uh, his issues and like why he fell was because of his lack of defensive play and his defensive game really did suffer quite a lot but if it his was his back that was causing the problem and if that's fixable then you know you're getting a really dynamite player that could be he would be the best offensive player defenseman that the flames have had since Fanuf. so yeah, and of all of these guys in the draft, uh, this is one that's intrigued me since about Christmas when I really started looking into him. I've watched a lot of footage and seen a lot of reports from you know the teams he's played for, and yeah, I think he's not only probably the best, uh, one of the best defensemen. I think he's probably one of the very best skaters in the entire draft as well. Yeah, that's why like I have him rated as a ten out of ten, but with a caveat: if his injuries are not a big deal, then the Flames would be stupid to pass on it. The one thing that I've noticed about him in stuff that I've read and stuff that I've seen online, um, he tends, and I think this is something that you can work with the player on definitely, but it seems like his confidence can be a problem. If he's not having a good game or you know something like that, he tends to um, lose confidence, and that can sometimes bring down his production for a game or two. Yeah. And the consistency is usually a problem with a lot of players at that age. And it it would take a little bit to get teach him to be a defenseman as well. Like you see, sometimes he does make a, the occasional bad pinch or the bad a bad decision in the defensive zone. But like even if he's just okay defensively, his offensive skill would more than make up for it. Just like with Carlson and Subban. For sure. Yeah, no, I I think that he's, as you said, if he's not injured and if we know that he's got a clean bill of health, um, I definitely think that he is a guy to take if he's available. And I think a lot of other teams will feel that way too, though, so I'm not sure he's going to make it to 15th. What do you think? I could easily see him going 10th if a team really likes him. It, it really just depends. If... His injury troubles are overblown. Like it, everybody could use a really dynamite offensive defenseman like Kylington. So who knows? Like I do know that Ottawa is actually very interested in him, and they pick at 18th. So it's one of those things that uh, that actually might be a good trading partner for the Flames if they're really interested, because they do pick again at 42nd. So. If they really want Kylington, you know, the Flames might be willing to drop down three spots to get the extra pick. Yeah, we'll we'll see. I think he's definitely going to be one of the most interesting stories going into this draft. Yeah, he's the probably the biggest wild card of anybody. Him and Sprong are the two big wild ones. I can't see a scenario in which um, Kylington does not go in the top 30, do you? No, it, it would have to be like his injury troubles are just that bad. Yeah, but in that case, I think he's going to fall quite hard. Yeah, like you'd probably be able to get him at 53 if that was the case. Yeah, no, I, I think that he'll definitely go in the top 30. I think, you know, maybe even a team that has a couple first round picks might take him with their second one if he's still on the board and go, okay, we've got one kind of sure pick and one that's a little bit more risky. Yeah, because I think the Flyers and the Leafs have picks in around 20 to 25. So if they're on the board, then yeah. I could see Kylington doing well in the Flyers organization too. True. Just the kind of way that he plays, I could see him doing well there. And the last guy that will profile for this uh, show, for the first round, the 15th overall pick, is I'm surprised, kind of surprised you threw him in here. Um, a player who I've seen mostly ranked fairly low, and that's Jeremy Roy, who's a defenseman 
uh, 18 years old, six foot, 187 pounds. What is it about Roy that uh, you think might make him interested to the interest in the Flames? He's a very good overall defenseman. He's sort of Zaboral light, and he, if you basically combine Sealoff and Watherspoon, you'd get Wa or Roy, whichever, and. He's just a solid player. I I personally wouldn't want to see him being selected at 15, but if the Flames did opt to trade down, he like Besser, he might be a good fit. Interesting. Yeah, because I've seen him kind of ranked 20th to 24th in most, uh, most lists that I've seen. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with his game. It's He's okay. Like, the... That's the thing with all the players that we've profiled. They're all good. So you can pick and choose whichever guy you like the most, and you know, you're going to get a good player. So. so, Matt, based on the list of players we just went through, the about 10 players that we just looked at, you have rated all these players on our website. And for those that don't know, uh, firesidechat.ca, Matt has lists of all these players, plus a lot more, mostly in the first 90 players uh, is where he's focused on, but you can go and read a review of the guy. You can get some information on his pros and his cons, uh, where we think it should be taken, and also watch some video. So if you want to familiarize yourself with any of these players, start at firesidechat.ca, and you'll see all of the players there. Yeah, it's just basically to give people like a Coles notes of like, this is what the guy has going for him. This is where he needs to work on. And, you know, any specifics like with Kylington with his back injury, like if there's something odd about the player that like, I'll discuss that as well. So that way you just have a little bit more information without having to read like this massive article, like some sites do well and there's so much stuff out there too i mean if you google any one of these guys names you'll find you know eight nine ten different sites talking about these guys so it's nice to have one place you can go to get you know a stub of information almost and then from there if there's a guy you're really excited about you can go look him up even further yeah and plus i provide video for literally every player so that way you can see the player himself in various video clips so you can make up your own mind and see like what you like about the player as well which is always nice because i know there's been times when i found myself for players that i really hadn't looked at all that well just parodying what i heard guys like craig button saying and that sort of thing so it's always nice to be able to form your own opinion on some of these guys but with that in mind, Matt, of the 10 players we talked about, um, you ranked them all for how much you want to see the Flames play them. Uh, you ranked Connor an 8 out of 10. You ranked Sprong a 10 out of 10. You ranked uh, Zaboral a 9. Chabot and Kylington both a 10 as well. Let's say that you are the Flames GM. You're in Sunrise, Florida. Beautiful day in Florida. You walk up to the podium at 15th, and all those guys are available. You can take... Kyle Connor, you can take Daniel Sprong, you can take Jakub Zaboral, you can take Thomas Chabot, or Oliver Kylington. Who do you put a Flames jersey on? Without a doubt, no doubt about it, no question marks, Kyle Connor. And who would be who'd be your second choice in that list? Second choice, it would be mostly dependent on external factors, because I would go with either Sprong or Kylington if their issues are not a big deal. If they are, it would be a toss-up between either Zaboral or Chabot. It's one of those things that they're all kind of... You you can't really go wrong with any of those four players. It's just, it the two, it depends on if their issues are overblown or not. So... It, that one's a little harder because I'm an outsider, so I don't have any inside information. I've never met either of the players or talked to them, so I don't know anything more than any fan would. So if the, it's not a big deal, then I'd likely go with one of either Sprong or Kylington. But if it is a big deal, I'd go with one of the two defensemen from the queue. That makes sense. And I think, you know... I haven't, again, I haven't talked to Trilliving. I haven't talked to anyone in the organization, but I think that there might also be, if 
you know, there's two or three guys weighed equally, I could see them deciding to go with a defenseman because I think that everybody knows the Flames are a little bit short on defense right now. Oh, it's not even that big of a deal, especially in the second round. There's like a dozen defensemen that are rated in the 45 to 60 range. So, like, there's we'll have more than enough opportunity to get some good defensemen in the second round. So it's not quite as big of a deal in the first. So if we take a look around the the web at some of the mock drafts uh, where people think players are going to be taken, it's interesting to take a look at. Uh, Craig Button, who writes for TSN, thinks that uh, the Flames with the 15th will probably take Kyle Konecki. Um, they're looking at him at, to go 15th. They're expecting that Connor will go 13th and Zaboral, or sorry, yeah, Connor will go 13th and Zaboral will go 14th. So I wouldn't be surprised if Konecki was uh, who we took. Interesting, interesting enough, though, uh, NHL Central Scouting picked the Flames to take uh, Jansen Harkins, who we didn't even talk about. Why did Harkins not factor into this discussion, Matt? Harkins is a boring player in the, much the same way that Monaghan is a boring player. He's just not at the same level as Monaghan. Like, he does everything okay. He's a very good player. Just less so. That's all. He's a boring player that got a 79 points for the Prince George Cougars as an alternate. And I've heard him talked a little bit about and compared to David uh, Crikey, who I've never been all that impressed with either. I mean, he's a good player, but yeah, he's he does the right things, but he's not fun to watch. That's what I'm basically getting at. Just good all the way around. He, he'll fit in your lineup. He'll get you a bunch of points, but there's not a lot of flash to his game. Like, there's no Gaudreau at all in his game. That's all. And for the first round, it always seems like teams want that flashy guy, that guy you can kind of get the fans excited about. And I'm not sure uh, Harkins would be that guy. No, he would be your good, solid second, third line center. Basically backland with a little bit more skill. That's all. Which is okay. There's no nothing wrong with that. Everybody needs players like that. But, you know, with the Flames being deep in center, having Bennett, Monahan, and Jankowski, plus a whole litany of other guys, eh, I wouldn't... If the Flames took them, I wouldn't be disappointed. But uh, they're, with so many right-wingers and defensemen on the board that are comparably or more talented, I would rather draft for need because there's not really much of a difference. Okay. Good to know. Um, last question I'll ask you, and I've heard this discussed a lot this year, and I think we'll probably have different opinions on this. How much stock do you put in the results of the combine as far as the ability of these players or their ability to, I guess, perform an elite level. You might remember last year, Sam Bennett was unable to do a chin-up and was still drafted fairly early. What do you think the role of the Combine is and how much stock would you be putting in as a GM? The Combine, like as a GM, it is a great tool because you get to talk to all these players at, by and large because most of the players interview like 20 to 30 teams. And you can have like a little file book saying like, okay, this guy has this, 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 and that whatever so you know even if you don't draft the guy you can look back in the future and if you're looking at trading for him you know what i mean but for how it actually translates to the draft i don't think it's really much relevance i do know that uh sam bennett's pull-up issue probably was the thing that pushed the oilers to take dry Sadel instead because the last thing they needed was another smaller player that wasn't physically strong. Yeah, no, that's probably true. And the Flames seemed like they didn't care either way. He was their man. Yeah, well, the Flames, they you know, six foot, that they still have a lot of taller players. So, like, you look at Edmonton and uh, Nugent Hopkins and Eberle are both on the short side. So adding another guy... Yeah, they needed more size than anything. 
Yeah, I think, you know, even outside of the uh, talking to the players, I think that the combine can be a useful way to gather data. But I think by the time you get to the combine, and even the Flames have said they wanted to have all their draft meetings done before they even get to the combine and their list put in order. I think by the time you get there, you probably have a good idea of who these guys are and what their weaknesses are. The only time I could really see putting a lot of stock into some of the individual, you know, exercises they do would be if you have a worry about injury or worry about, you know, weak parts of their body and you could confirm or deny it uh, kind of through some of yeah, those numbers. Sort of like Kylington. Yeah. And that might be a good way to go through and say, okay, you know, does this guy have back problems? Does he not? Um, but I don't think I would probably as a GM look and go, oh, wow, this guy didn't do as well as I hoped in a 10-meter sprint or in chin-ups, which really don't directly relate to what he's going to be doing for you, which is playing the game of hockey. True. And the only thing that would probably cause players to fall off the radar if they were being potentially looked at is if they interview with the GM rather poorly. Like, if they come off as a total jerk, then you know and not like committed to learning or anything then that might strike him off but other than that like i don't see anything that would really mess with the rankings too too much no me neither um and and i think you know some of the if you look at some of the tests they do like there's that one i don't even know what they call it but they make them ride the stationary bike while they plug their nose to see how long they can go and I've always thought stuff like that's a silly test because, I mean, these guys are on the ice for, what, 30, 45, maybe 60 seconds maximum. Like, you know, seeing if you can ride a bike for three, four minutes with your nose plugged, it just seems like it's irrelevant and more of a hazing than it is an actual, you know, useful exercise. Yeah, it's one of those things that they do what they do and they obviously get some benefit out of it, but... Yeah, you know, I would leave that up to people that are trained in that field to know why they would do that. Well, before we go this week, Matt, I want to promote again to everybody, because it's been a couple of weeks, the uh, 2015 Fireside Chat audience survey. For the first time ever, we're asking you guys to give us feedback on how we're doing with the show, with the website, all that kind of thing. Uh, we've set up a little online survey. You can go to our website, firesidechat.ca, and the second post from the top, you'll see the audience survey, or go to firesidechat.ca slash survey and take the survey. It'll take you probably 10 minutes, and it's asking you for your input on things like, you know, what do you think of the show? Uh, various questions. Do you think the show's too long or too short? Uh, how often do you visit the website? That sort of thing. And this is really going to help us as we make our decisions in the off season going forward about things that we're going to do in the future. And for you helping us out, if you fill out the survey and if you give us your name and email at the end, which is totally optional, if you want to be anonymous, you can. But if you do decide to give us that info, we're going to enter you into a draw and one person who's taken the survey is going to win a cool Fireside Chat prize pack. And uh, right now we've got in that prize pack a Fireside Chat t-shirt, a uh, uh, Calgary Flames baseball cap, a Fireside Chat can cooler, uh, some temporary tattoos of both Calgary Flames and Fireside Chat. We got some uh, Flames logo stickers, a Flames bag, and a full collectible set of the 2013 Read It to Give It a Shot program bookmarks. So a great prize pack for just taking 10 minutes out of your day and taking that survey. So if you can find some time over the next week to take that, Matt, and I would be really appreciative. Matt, anything else you want to cover about the first round? No, that's it. It's just... This is probably one of the deepest drafts that I've seen in recent history. I The only one that I can say definitively that was better was 2003. And you're getting players that even go like into the 50s and 60s that normally would have would go in like the 30 range. So it's really good and it, the fact that the Flames have six picks in the top 90 will really stock the pool with the next wave of top players coming through so for those that don't remember in the 2003 draft uh the top 10 in that draft mark andre Fleury went first eric stahl was second nathan horton third nikolai jardev fourth uh thomas vanek milan mcculloch ryan Suter, braden corburn 
uh, Coburn, Dion Phaneuf, Andre Kostitsin was number 10, and it keeps going. We got, you know, Jeff Carter, Dustin Brown, Brent Seabrook, um, Zach Parise. So, yeah, I'd say that was a really – Ryan Getzlaff's in there. That was quite a draft as well. Yeah. Perry was, like, the second last pick of the first round. You had Shea Weber in the second. You had like, Louis Erickson a lot of, in the second. Yeah, Patrice there's a lot of talent. Yeah. Uh, even Jimmy Howard went 64th. Yeah, this draft is – not quite as good but especially with the higher end part of the talent but uh, the amount of quality you're getting in the second and third rounds is remarkable like at the back end of the third round is more like the back end of the second round last year and you know when i look at this draft and the depth in that top 90 i think what a good time to be in a rebuild yeah and the fact that the flames have six picks like a you know, at times I wish the Flames had 10 or 12. That's how many good players there are. Well, you never know what they might do through a trade or through, um, you know, other other means. They might be able to move up and get some more picks. Yep. We'll see. Yeah. All right, Matt. Well, we will talk to you next week when we will profile rounds two through seven in the draft and take a look at some of the players that we might expect the Flames to take with some of those other top 90 picks. You have a good week, and we'll talk to you next week. Yep. Take care. Thanks for listening, everyone. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.